Hello and welcome to a new first taste for the channel where today we're going to be checking out Inkbound, a delightful turn-based tactical roguelike from the developers of Monster Train. Playable both solo or co-op, this game has an incredibly cosy yet whimsical style that conjures nostalgic memories of old books and movies like Inkheart or the Sandman series, whilst also having a really comfortable gameplay loop that reminds me most of games like Spiral Knight and that's very high praise coming from me. And like Spiral Knight, Shiny Shoe have done a great job of making a game that clearly feels designed for a co-op experience, just as engaging to play in single player as not, something that I know some of you will be very pleased to hear. Aside from the obvious stories coming to life theme, what exactly is Inkbound? Well, not to put too fine a point on it, it's a draft battler with a core gameplay loop not too dissimilar from games like Slay the Spire and indeed Monster Train. You fight a series of battles, choosing between encounters and the battles themselves based largely on what rewards you want to claim at the end of them, with a goal to upgrade skills and collect items that synergize well with your chosen class so that you can defeat the final boss at the end of your run. But, win or lose, you gain some meta progress which contributes to new unlockables for future runs and then start the cycle anew. Though, with this having a bit more RPG in its DNA than other games, there's also quests and to unlock new classes, dailies and even seasons to keep you interested and in playing. Though, on the topic of seasons, there's also a cash shop where you can purchase season passes that allows you to unlock additional rewards as you progress through each season and hit milestones. So far as I've seen, these largely seem to be cosmetics or emotes, and pleasantly, I noticed that during an active season, you can earn the meta currency, called shinies, which actually gave me a bit of a chuckle, to purchase the season pass entirely through gameplay, rather than having to use any real world money, something that I often like to see in games as it caters to both those with disposable income but not much free time and those with a lot of free time but not much disposable income. Now if all of that sounds intriguing then hang tight and we'll jump straight into a deep dive so I can showcase the game directly. And if you fancy checking the game out for yourself, remember that you can find links in, for the game in the video description. And while you're there, if you decide you enjoyed what you saw and you want to see more, let Saint Algorithmus know with those beautiful buttons down below. But with all of that said and done, let's dive into the game. Okay then, so at the beginning of your dive, you will be at the Sea of Ink. Now, as this is a deep dive, our dive length has been increased and there are book mutators that have been added. Minions have increased maximum HP and there are more difficult challenge buffs there as well. This is f The deep dives are effectively a ranked run and because I've played a little bit, we're on challenge tier two. So uh, you will probably have it a little bit easier starting off if this is your first deep dive. Uh, for the sake of this, I've also just activated a single quest this is one of the kind of class quests i've got to speak with the gardener at garden's edge so that'll give me a little bit of guidance on some of the uh, choices that i might make but there are a massive list of quests i'm just keeping the ui a little bit uh, clearer for the sake of this video now the first thing that you have to decide is what kind of boss you're going to fight and that will also dictate or more often the case uh you will Pick what kind of quest you're going to run through this dive, and that will dictate what boss you face at the end of it. So we have Shadow of uh, Runestone, inflict 1,800 stacks of poison. Now that one is a relatively easy one for us to get with the Moss Cloak, as it shouldn't be too hard for me to make a quite potent poison build. We've got, got Argolath, inflict the dazed or deal critical hits 60 times. This one also, fairly easy to do, the, depending on the way we build our character. And then finally, Cinder. Fully augment three bindings. That is to get three of these bindings down here. You've got your bindings over on the side and uh, I think vestiges they're called over on this side. Effectively, items that mutate or in some way change the characteristics of your run. Now, I am running with a particular trinket. This is something that you unlock through going through the story, the ability to use trinkets. Our trinket is Talons of Sin. Poison is more likely to show up in drafts, so that is a point in favor of the Shadow Runestone, but also inflicts four poison stacks on the first enemy you hit each turn, and after inflicting 150 poison, or rather poison 150 times, reduce the rate at which poison decays from 50% per turn to 33% per turn. That is, uh, at the end of a turn, 
any stacks of poison on an enemy normally reduce by 50% after they've done their damage, but this would reduce that decay rate, and that can be quite substantial, especially for a run where my goal is to apply poison stacks. Uh, now, I don't really, I haven't played the game enough to have a favored boss to fight, so we're just going to go with the 1,800 stacks of poison, as that also gives me a fairly solid direction to take this build in. Now, as I am still relatively early in playing, though level 27 might seem like a lot, I basically got here just by getting absorbed into the game when I opened it up for the first time and decided to give it a bit of a, uh, a try. Uh, we will discover a lot of dialogue. There's a lot of quests in the game, but for the sake of the video, I'm not going to go into these too much. I will obviously try and reach my uh, my quests over on the side, but uh, for a bit of flavor. Some of them are voiced, some of them are not. Uh, so how does the Garden's Edge fare in these dark times? Unlikely to be the bastion of peace and respite it was originally meant to be. <laughs> You know that particular book was actually some of my own work. I really love the, the the thematic style of this game. It gives me such... Well, when I first started playing this, I got the distinct kind of um, nostalgia of watching the, the old film Inkheart for some reason. Uh, the Aetherium can get, well, suffocating. So this book was meant as a hideaway from all of the egos, though I doubt you know this. Good, needless. Always thinking the best of us terrible souls. When you do return to the Garden's Edge, that is, be sure to take a breath. Hmm? Might be a bit darker than it once was, but if I did my bindings right, it should have a little piece still left in it. I love the idea of that. Okay, now the Garden's Edge is a particularly a, a moss cloak um, kind of class uh, quest, so I'm, I'm going to be going there anyway, so that's uh, quite nice. Now then, let's have a look. This would build quite well for us, as it means whenever I cause a critical hit, I'll inflict 10 stacks of poison. That will work towards our Inflict Poison quest. So this one is a pretty easy choice, and sometimes they're a bit harder. On your first turn, gain 5 shield. I mean, that's nice, but it'll only last for the first turn. On your turn, Inflict Marked on the furthest enemy. Now, that one isn't actually bad. That one could be used quite well. We also have a way of applying Mark, though, thanks to our Scavenger's Dash. So it's not as necessary. And since this one will help us with our main dive quest, I'll pick that one. The way that the, the dive quest works is you need to have completed it before you hit the boss room. If you hit the boss room and then complete it while in the boss room, you still don't get the reward. The reward has to be claimed before the boss. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Now let's have a look in here. Okay, poison dash, inflict four stacks of poison. Alternatively, I could take critical flurry. Now this will increase my crit chance and my crit damage. The crit damage is a percent, so you would do this much percent extra damage because it was a crit, not a flat amount, as I once thought. And uh, crit chance is the, the chance whenever a skill comes off cooldown that it will be marked as a critical, um, it, that it'll have a critical charge applied to it. You'll see that throughout the run. Some of these will occasionally have flames over them. That means when I use them, they're going to hit as a crit. Um, it's an interesting way of doing it. Rather than rolling when the skill is activated, you know with certainty that that skill is going to cause a crit, but the, the roll happens when it comes off cooldown, which I, I quite like, actually. Uh, but we're going to take Poison Dash again, because that is going to work for us. And Venge, uh, sorry, the Vengewood, the Radiant Market, and the Proven Grounds. I don't really need to go to any of these, so honestly, this is going to come down to the Book Mutators. Uh, so second phase, Villains and Guardians deal 35% more damage when brought to half health. Guardians are mini-bosses. Never-ending story. Enemies restore 15% of their missing HP each turn. That is a terrifying mutator, but I love the, the, the name, so it's always tempting to grab it. And then overstimulated. On collecting an orb, take one damage. Now, orbs are per turn um, collectibles in the arena, which give you a little bit of a buff. So making that little bit of a buff more dangerous is kind of a, a bitter pill to swallow, but it probably is the easiest of all of them. That'll give me a nice little potion there. So the procedural element has now begun proper. Mercurial Elixir, uh, I mean, it can be useful, but it's probably my least favorite of all of the potions. This one will give us uh, reduced cooldown of a random binding to zero. So it will allow me to cast it, assuming I have the willpower to cast. Willpower is the resource that I use for casting abilities. Health is my resource for surviving battles. Uh, the three kind of baked in uh, bindings that I have with the Moscow class are Shuriken Throw, uh, deal 50 damage, 
uh, but it'll go through opponents. I, I can't really show it just now, but we will get into the, the exact way to use the skills once we're in a battle. Scavenger's Dash, it is a movement style uh, repositioning ability, but you can build it as we have here to cause a bit of damage as well. And Flurry, which unleashes shurikens. Shurikens are kind of the gimmick of this class. Uh, on my turn, I gain one shuriken. And also certain abilities can stack my shurikens. I can have a maximum of five stacks and some of my abilities consume my shurikens to do extra damage. Now, we can go to a Tarnished Vault or a Quilling Cage, the, the currency up here that we'll be using. Uh, I think we're going to go for the Tarnished Vault. I am always in favor of having more items. Now, we have to fight to get access to the Tarnished Vault, so this is going to be the first combat that we go into. Now, it is turn-based combat, so I can take some time to explain what I'm doing here. Right, let's have a quick look at him. Uh, it's always worthwhile checking out what everything does. So, this is Glass Cannon. Deals 50% increased damage and takes 50% increased damage. So it should be fairly easy for me to kill. If you hold down Alt, though, you can actually have this always uh, turned on. This will give additional information, like the hit points, the amount of damage they're going to do. But there's an awful lot of information going on here. So the AOE effects that are being shown there, that will only hit within this area. It is undodgeable in the sense of a vase, which will come uh, come into more of uh, prominence later on once I've actually started to build a vase. You might notice as well, we've already got throw on a crit. But this direct uh, dagger kind of uh, arrow here on the floor, that means that it's going to be a direct attack. That absolutely can be evaded. So this is something that should be paid attention to. Also, it is unavoidable in the sense I can move anywhere in this arena. And until I do something when I've moved in, I can just move and reposition to try and find the best place. Over here, I'm not taking any damage from the AoEs, but these enemies can cross more or less an infinite distance to get to me. There are some exceptions, but it's very well telegraphed when that is an exception in place. So these ones will both hit me, so I'll take six damage here. So you can do a lot of planning in your turn. Now, the other thing that uh, we've got is the power orb down here. That is the orb that I mentioned that will... Um, it is useful. It will pull down all of my skills cooldown. So it's usually worth only uh, taking this towards the end of your turn. And it will give you a will point, which you can then use as the, the currency to use on your item. So, for example, Flurry here has a cooldown of two and costs one will to use. But now I'm also going to take damage when I use those, which isn't the best. So let us decide how we are going to do this. These are the two that I need to care about right now. So you can move around with Wasid, by the way, and actually sometimes that's much, much more useful. Uh, also, the Scavenger Dash here. So we've got a uh, kind of a column column that we'll move through and we'll hit all enemies in that column. This will add marked, so plus 100% uh, incoming damage on being hit, lose one stack, on turn end lose all stacks, so ideally apply it to things and then make sure you actually hit them otherwise you've wasted the marked status and this does have a two turn cooldown so i do need to plan around that but it'll also drop a bunch of uh, poison stacks and poison is a magic damage item so if you look across here you'll see this is my magic damage stat uh, that will increase the amount of, of uh, or rather that defines uh, the resistance and also as my magic damage goes up that would in turn go up but also my poison damage specifically can uh, influence this so additional poison damage whenever I apply a poison effect but magic damage will apply to any effect that is magical in nature. Right okay so given that I do want to try and remove these a little bit. So let me dash through here. That's Trick number one, there we go. That marked really helped there to get that shuriken to do max damage. At this point, I would very much like to damage you. However, getting over to you is going to be a problem. And uh, as much as I was kind of talking down about uh, about the uh, Mercurial Elixir, this is actually going to help me right here. Now, I can use Flurry. This will deal 25 damage, then consume your shurikens and unleash them forward, each dealing 25 damage for a total of 100 damage since, uh, oh, well, actually, uh, currently I've got three. So if everything hits, then I'll do a total of 100 damage to everything. So there we go. We'll get to that one. I'm going to pick up the power orb here. I'm then going to use the Mercurial Elixir. Gives me enough room to just kind of get out of dodge if I really want to. But actually, what I would most like to... Well, I don't really want to use dash because it's not going to do a lot of damage in and of itself. Whereas this will kill. So let me 
Just go ahead and do that. Then I can slip out of there. I'll take no damage, and I've removed the uh, the most dangerous enemies to me. And that uh, poison there, doing quite well. One of the things I really love about the dots in this game is each type of dot does a different thing. So we've got uh, a couple of uh, types. We've got poison, there's also frostbite, there's burn. And they work differently. They have different mechanics to how the stacks diminish over time, if indeed they do diminish, how they do damage. And it makes the, the dots feel really interesting. Uh, not that, that dots don't feel interesting normally, but they, they, they're a little bit samey in, in most games, I think we can all agree. There we go, let's just uh, dump that damage there. And there we go, that first fight is over. Nice and easy. Now, for the sake of the YouTube video, I'm going to go into settings, and we are going to go over to uh, turning on combat details. Now, this is going to clutter the UI a little bit, but I feel this is going to be more useful for anyone watching the video here to be able to see why things are happening a certain way and why I'm making uh, tactical decisions. Right, so we can get some more poison damage. This will just make our poison do more damage over time, or I can start building crit chance or crit damage. Honestly, all of these are kind of nice, but for this build in particular, considering we're going to really be trying to dump poison on our enemies, poison is a pretty easy one to go for. If we have a look at that, it's just additional poison damage per stack. So if we have a look at that, after enemy attacks, deal eight magic damage. So the norm is you will do five magic damage. That's how poison works after the enemy attacks. Though so bear that in mind. As far as I'm aware, all of the dots apply after the enemy has made their move and attacked you. So you're not going to have this uh, case where you can rely on poison to kill the enemy before they manage to kill you. It, you if, if it is a case that you're both going to die, it's just going to be a ferric victory for the enemy. You will lose. Uh, but because we're adding three extra poison damage, it takes that magic damage up to eight and then the enemy will lose half of those tax, uh, stacks of poison. Right, Tarnished Vault. We've got uh, Poison Thorn on hitting. Inflict two stacks of poison. Again, very nice. On your first turn, gain one stack of evade. Or on your turn, a 35% chance to gain one will. This would add a little bit of extra magic power, so damage from magic sources deal 10% more damage per point. Elusive Whisperer, this would give us crit damage uh, of 25, so we would be doing 75% more damage when we crit, or Poison Thorn. I think it has to be Poison Thorn, getting more and more and more of those stacks, because that is both going to build into our Carved Talents of Sin and also our main quest. Now, Critical Flurry. This is augmenting a binding. So you're basically leveling up bindings or adding new bindings as you go. This one is just going to level up one of the three that we've got. So I can have Poison Dash. Uh, we've already got Poison Dash, which adds, adds for Poison. It's very rare that I want to take the same thing, um, especially because this is effectively a very low tier augment. The, the augments themselves, the borders will tell you how rare they are, uh, from basically gray all the way up to golden. Uh, sharp throw, so more damage on my uh, on my shurikens, or critical flurry, which just gives us a, a bit more crit chance and crit damage. Now, I don't know if this gives that to all of my attacks or just when I use Flurry. I guess we'll take this anyway. That little marker there tells me I've not taken this before and I do have a quest to basically explore every kind of upgrade on every kind of skill, so I'll take this for no other reason than to see if that would work. No, that one that one seems to only affect uh, Critical Flurry itself. Oh well, that's a bit of a shame. Right, moving on. A trove of bindings, a nice easy choice. You do uh, up, uh, sometimes have up to three choices on where to go. Gain a powerful new binding or ascend one if your bar is full. Well, my bar isn't full, so we're going to gain a new binding here. So let's grab a little bit of cash around there. Okay, so this is our draft binding. We can take Cultivate, create a plant that grants one will for each turn it's on the ground. And then after I think it's like five or, or six turns, it will disappear. So you do want to use it. But it's basically an orb that gets stronger the longer, the, the more patient you are with collecting it. Poison Vapor, deal 10 damage in a large area around you and inflict 30 stacks of poison. Well, I mean, the choice has already been made for us, really. And Incendiary, deal 50 damage in a small area and inflict 5 stacks of burn. Now, this will give us uh, give an indicator of how the, the dots differ. Poison, we already know, 
deals a uh, certain amount of damage per stack after the enemy's attack, and then the enemy loses half of those stacks. Burn, uh, after the enemy attack, deals 10 magic damage in this case per stack, and only loses one. So this has a much more dangerous kind of snowballing effect because you're losing less from the stack. But obviously, we're going to go with Poison Vapor uh, just because that's going to build into all of our quests. Now, this is a uh, bit of a choice. We've got Binding Empowerment, gain a free Binding Augment and the capability to purchase another. We do not have anywhere near the Quillings to be able to purchase the other, so that's not as useful for us. A Rift in the Story creates an opportunity for you to make a powerful choice. This is a bit of a gamble. You'll have three options, and based on your resources... You might be locked out of some of the options. I usually don't take this until I've got about 100, 150 quillings and at least three or four um, glyphs to be able to spend to make sure I can get the best choice. But sometimes you can be lucky and you can just get a powerful choice very early on that's relatively free. So again, it's a, it's a gamble. Uh, then you've got the Tethered Shrine. Within the runes, your quill senses forgotten power for you to harness. This one's probably the uh, safest route for us to go, but uh, if, you, if you are a, a braver man than I, uh, then you can, of course, go for the early gamble and uh, it may, may work out very, very well for you and and uh, you may end up coming away with a ridiculous snowballing effect in some of the earliest levels. Now, we've got a story fragment, this part of a quest for me. Place your hand upon the podium, and your quill begins to pulse. In your hand appears a torn page with fading ink. A story fragment, now yours. Thank you very much indeed. There we go. Slowly building up uh, those story fragments for my quest. Again, this is a game... Like a lot of uh, sort of account-bound online-ish games, uh, I, I say online-ish, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, or perhaps I'll, I'll do that in the preamble. Uh, the way the, the, the account works, you can't really just reset progress. You have a an ongoing story the whole way through, and it does make it a little bit harder to do the videos on this, so if we should do more videos on this in the future, just understand that I'm not really going to be trying to follow any of the quests in video form, because I, I'll be finding little snippets here and there across so many different runs, but there is a very compelling story to this. I I actually really, really enjoy the writing, and uh, if you do decide to pick up this game for yourself, I would uh, would very much like to know down in the comments as well what you think about the writing. I, I actually find it quite charming myself. Now, movement is always useful, being able to reposition. Uh, physical power, that does uh, the equivalent to our physical style attacks as our magic uh, power does. Uh, so that would affect Flurry, that would affect Throw, it wouldn't affect Poison Vapor or the Poison Afflicted uh, from our various skills either. Uh, but crit damage, 30, uh, plus 30 crit damage is always nice. We could take healing if I needed it, but I'm actually going to re-roll this because I didn't like any of those. Uh, I mean... Three physical powers is actually harder to turn down. Uh, that would give us a 30% more damage from our physical attacks, but 15 extra movement per as well is extremely hard to turn down. I'm actually going to take the movement. I feel that uh, the Moss Cloak in particular benefits enormously from being able to uh, reposition. Uh, we're going to go to the Superior Vault over here, and also an opportunity to fish. Let's see what we get. So I've got a potion, Disintegration Oil. Uh, we can left-click to consume to inflict Hex and Shatter on all enemies. Or we've got the Crimson Quillfish. Left-click to consume to gain three ability power, which is lost at the end of combat. Ability power... It's kind of like a, a merger of physical and magic power. Your damage from physical and magic sources deals 10% more damage. So, honestly, if you can only upgrade one, upgrade ability power, because then you're upgrading both. But uh, it is uh, definitely a harder one, typically, to find ways to upgrade. Now then, we've got this elixir. That one actually didn't hurt last time. And there's two ways that we can go with this. You can just eat the fish now, and the effects will last in the next combat. Alternatively, if there is a chance that you'll use the potions, as this potion is so close to this uh, arena, I can just come, come back down here and pick that up after the fight if I find that I've used up one of my other potions. So you've got a couple of options here, and I think that's the option I'm going to take. This game kind of rewards you for using the potions, honestly. It, it doesn't punish you by making potions so rare that you're always 
attempted to keep hold of them. Now, first thing we're going to do is check out what all of these creatures do. We've got the uh, Ringling, uh, which has aggression. On being hit, we'll turn to face the attacker. So that means if you were playing with uh, two people, you might actually be able to, to juggle this quite aggressively. Though it doesn't look like it will continually look. Like this isn't just a regular direct attack. For example, if I move down here, it's just going to charge in that direction. It'll only turn to the attacker, but won't follow the attacker. So even in solo, I can control where this is going to be doing its damage quite, uh, quite well. This is a treasure pot. It's just a treasure goblin, effectively. Every 25% of its max HP threshold will drop some quilling. So as we, at 75, 50, 25. And defeating it will drop even more. We'll flee combat after two turns. And then we've got the tangled quills. Phasing. Phases at the start of turn, causing it to dodge the first attack made against it, but afterwards takes 25% more damage. It is currently phased, and snaring strike. On hitting, inflict snare, reducing movement until the end of their turn. Now, I very much want to take out the treasure pot if I'm at all able to do so. Uh, so that's what we're going to try and focus on right now. I've only got one shuriken right now, but let's go ahead and dodge through both of you. There we go. Put a little bit of damage on each. I am then going to use Poison Vapor. Uh, actually, if I can scooch over here. Poison Vapor is going to go through their phasing. Uh, the Poison Vapor itself did 10 damage. So that, uh, that turned off their phasing. But now they've got a nice big stack of poison. Which means they're going to lose most of their health on their turn. That's true of the Treasure Pot as well. But they'll still do a chunk of damage regardless. Uh, now I can do another bit of damage down here. We'll almost kill the uh, Wrinkling. Uh, deal damage. Nice. A uh, little bit of a, a milestone hit there. I've got one more point left, and can I reach this from here? I can, so I'm going to pick that up. Now, I could inflict Hex and Shatter on all enemies. Honestly, I should have done that first, realistically. Uh, I'll do that next turn, I think, because we're going to see a couple more enemies spawning in, three enemies spawning in specifically. Now, I really would like it if I could have dodged out of here, but I kind of misplayed that one, if I'm perfectly honest. Uh, let's see... Can I do anything else here? No, not really. Right, you're both going to die, so I'm going to get the, the pot. But that was quite a messy play. If I'm Actually, I could take you out and do some of my incoming damage. If only I could just scooch over there. Damn it, I was too busy trying to uh, showcase a bunch of the uh, different effects to properly plan there. And this is a lot of incoming damage now. But it's all direct damage, uh, which is a bit of an interesting one. We're going to use Disintegration Oil. Now, Hex receives 30, uh, an extra 30% incoming magic damage, lost at the start of the turn. Uh, Shatter receives extra physical damage, also lost at the start of turn. Now, I'm going to move over here and try and, well, I don't want to apply the mark against you because the first attack is going to fail to do as much damage because you're going to fake. So, I'm going to do that first. Then, I'm going to dash through. Then, we're going to take you out there we go reduce a little bit of the damage you will die on your turn but that's not really going to help me right now which is a bit of a shame uh let's see i have got three shurikens which i could unleash uh your phase so it wouldn't do much in fact i can't do anything against you because of that uh, i could almost kill you could I kill you? Yes, I can. Okay, well, I'll take you out of the, the running then. Let's reduce the incoming damage to just nine. Still, I don't have that much health, so this unnecessary amount of damage is very silly for me to take. Right, okay, let's uh, start being a little bit more sensible now, shall we? You're going to die from the poison alone, so I don't need to worry too much about that. What I wouldn't mind doing is... Well, honestly, if I can just get down here and grab you... Can I get you from there? I, there we go. That means I'm going to be able to do this all the way through. And then if I can get into just the right position, I might be able to hit... Nah, I'm not going to be able to hit all of you. Uh, that's a bit of a shame. Uh, unless... Well, actually, let me pop that. Let's see how much damage I can do in one go. There we go. To take three of them out, that's not a bad return on investment if i'm perfectly honest i can also do drop poison vapor but i don't think that's going to be as useful that's a nice little pot there uh or rather 
We could go with this, take both of you out. Thank you very much, because we had five shurikens. That actually worked out quite well for us. Can I reach it? No, I cannot. That's a bit of a shame. Okay, so I've got one will that's not going to be able to do anything for me this turn, but I take no damage, which is worth more in and of itself. Okay, Rotten Calzone. On inflicting poison, also inflict daze. Daze reduces uh, damage in, uh, from an enemy by 25%, which is amazing. It'll only last for one turn, but it's super, super useful. Uh, Powder Monkey's Stockpile gain two physical power for each binding on cooldown. And then Cloak of the Conspirator. On your turn, if you took no damage on the previous turn, gain a critical charge on all bindings. Now that one can be kind of bonkers because that would mean that every uh, attack that I make would add an extra 10 poison. But the Rotting Calzone, considering I've got so many things that are going to be applying poison, it's basically, are you are you gambling on being so good at being able to avoid damage that you're not that you're constantly going to be able to be in crit mode? Or are you gambling on just being able to apply so much poison damage that even though you're going to take damage, you're going to take less. I think we're going to go with Rotting Calzone if uh, the last couple of uh, rounds were anything to go by. As much as I would like to, to say we can avoid damage, we definitely don't have the, the sort of upgrades that I would need to be able to convincingly say that. Right. Widespread Vapor. Wider effect. Or... Damn it. Now I'm wishing I took the, the cloak. Shielding Dash. Maybe I should have checked that out first. On passing through enemies, gain one shield. This would be very, very nice. Uh, also, getting a stack of bleed here would be quite cool. Or a wider area for my vapor. But I think we're going to take shielding dash. It's such a powerful one, especially considering we're already applying uh, applying a decent amount of poison from it. So our dash is now going to be doing double duty as both a defense card and also an offensive card. Now, we've got 190 here. Binding Empowerment. I think you need about 250 to be able to purchase the second one. So until we've got that, I'm not going to go there. But I think we can probably try Sea Breach. Go on. Let's let's do a gamble at this point. We've got enough coins to be able to make it work for us. Okay. Alright. The Wandering Bender. Ah, oh, damn it. That would have been amazing if I'd had just a tiny bit more health. Okay. You can barely make out a binder of old, searching the depths of some unknown cavern. Since they are without their quill, you can only assume that's what they seek. But they the, the, that search looks dangerously close to ending, as the binder seems close to death. A little gift of life may be enough to keep him going. Do you offer the wandering binder any help? Uh, I could gain max help for... Uh, max HP for 15 HP. Now that's over half of what I got. Or I can give most of my health to gain quillings. I would have much preferred an epic vestige. But... Uh, given this, I will gain the, the max HP if I can. That will be useful. Uh, uncommon glyph. I don't need glyphs right now. Superior vault is where we're going. Let's head on out. So you may have also noticed that Along with increasing my max HP, it kept the ratio of my HP to max HP, so it did actually give me back some of that initial spent health as well, which is actually quite good. I didn't realize it was going to play out that way, but uh, it did in the end. You know what? Did I... <laughs> I didn't even go back and grab the uh, the pot. That was very silly. That was a little bit... Uh, a little bit uh, down in the dumps over how poorly that particular uh, fight had gone, if I'm perfectly honest. Right, let's see if we can do a little bit better this time. There we go. You're going to die on your turn, but that's not going to help me right now. You are actually uh, channeling, so you're inflicting Blazing Barrier to all enemies. Uh, blazing Barrier deals one damage to the attacker when taking damage, which isn't great for me. Uh, but what I am going to do is I'm going to pop up here. I'm going to try and pick up... Well, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. Can I take you out here? Yes, I can. Let's remove you. That fixes that for me. There we go. Collected that orb. You're going to die this turn, so what I want to do is really finish you off if I can. Uh, let's just drop down some shurikens over here. And, oh, uh, turn after next, you'll die. There we go. Not too bad at all. Now, what's everyone doing? You are currently going for a direct attack, but you should be easy for me to m remove. So I think I'm going to try and do that. I don't even need to particularly put much damage down on you to achieve that. 
Can I remove you safely? Hmm. I'm going to take a little bit of damage here, but I don't mind too terribly much. Uh, can I... We've got four. Can I get all three of you? There may be a magic pixel that allows me to do it. There is, in fact... I still took the damage, though. It was a bit of a shame. I was kind of hoping that I wouldn't take that damage initially, but oh well. Alright, let's just drop some shurikens on you, then. I am hemorrhaging my health. Early game with the Moss Cloak, I actually don't find that that is too uncommon. Uh, but once you've got a couple of abilities stacked up, especially like shields and the likes, then it can start really, really working out for you. Uh, we're going to attack from up here, I think. If we can, right down there. Yes, please. There we go. I would also like to make sure we catch you in the poison effect here. So let's do that. I'm going to grab you. There we go. Now that has absorbed some of the damage that I would have taken naturally. Uh, let's see if I can't remove some of the incoming damage here from all of you. I might not be able to get all of you, but I can certainly take two of you down, which does help out a little bit. I'm not going to be able to deal with you, unfortunately. There's not much I can do about that one. I can... Well, I don't actually apply any poison here, so I may as well just drop this attack there. In fact, it would have been better to go for you because you're not dazed at all. That would have been the better play there. Right, you're down, and it's only you two that are left for me to deal with, so I'm just going to top that off. There we go. We'll grab a, a little bit more thanks to that shield. And then we're going to unleash all the way through. Okay. We're kind of on our last legs, but, you know, it's not over till it's over. The Shining Circlet on collecting an orb reduce cooldowns of your highest cooldown binding by one. Uh, frozen Heart on being hit inflict three stacks of frostbite. I don't like gambling on being attacked. Uh, on hitting enemies for the first time each turn inflict shatter. Okay, that's not too bad, and it increases my physical damage, so I will definitely take that one. Let's have a look over here. You'd give me poison damage, you'd give me crit chance, but ultimately I need the health more than anything else right now. Alright, poison tipped throw. Okay, that would, at that point, mean that almost all of my abilities are doing poison, and that is definitely worth it. On hitting an enemy not inflicted with poison, inflict six stacks of poison, otherwise inflict two stacks. I mean, I'm inflicting poison from everything anyway, but this is really starting to build up. We're up to 101 out of the 150 that I need to get to, and 624 poison, so we're basically a third of the way there. Trove of Bindings. Gain a powerful new binding or ascend one if your bar is full. We do not have a full bar, so once again, we're not going to be able to ascend it here. Let's just go ahead and grab a little bit of everything there. Let's see what we've got. Smoke Bomb. Deal 60 damage in a large area and inflict days. Invigorate, gain 10 ability power for your next binding. Or steal a large amount of quillings from an enemy. None of these actually seem that useful to me, so I'm going to reroll. Alright, we've got Blink, we've got Quicken, reduce your other cooldowns by 1 and gain 20 movement. Cone of Frost, deal 20 damage in a large cone and inflict 4 stacks of Frostbite. Uh, Frostbite, uh, on being hit with a binding, will deal 30 magic damage and they will lose one stack of Frostbite. So, Frostbite is uh, basically a damage amplifier dot. Again, all of the dots do, do their damage in a different way, and I really, really do enjoy it. And this stack doesn't go down except when it triggers, and it'll only go down by one. Uh, but I'm going to take Blink, teleport to a far away, uh, uh, sorry, a far distance away, on turn start, full cost discount. So, at the, uh, the first use of this is free, assuming it's off cooldown. Right, within the ruins, the quill senses forgotten power for you to harness. Let's go and have a quick look at this. Right, we've got inscribe new power. More poison damage, spike damage, or magic power. Now, magic power and poison damage kind of do the same thing, but magic power will affect a couple more things ultimately. Uh, we have got... Well, actually, right now, the only only source of magic damage we've got is from our poison, so we may as well take poison then. Uh, this is magic movement, whereas this is physical movement, so there are a, certain, uh, a few things that might affect these, which would play off magic power or physical, but I think we're going to take poison damage for now. There we are, that should be fine. And we're heading over to the Carver's Refuge. Heal and spend some hard-earned quillings. Got 241, it's not enough for us to do something truly amazing with it, but I can absolutely heal. 
Now, you have... You can go all the way up to legendary vestiges here. Uh, this is the common one, Elusive Whisper. On your first turn, gain one stack of evasive. I almost never go for something that gives on first turn. Misery Whip on hitting, inflict one stack of bleed. Bleed is another dot. After enemy attacks, deal 12 physical damage. So this one builds off our physical rather than our magical. Now, note that it says nothing about reducing the stack, and that is correct. Unless they have some ability to remove stacks of debuffs, Bleed just builds with time. It is a terrifyingly powerful dot. And then we've got the Thunderstruck Bell. On your turn, inflict one stack of shock to a random enemy. On being hit, all other enemies are dealt 50% of damage taken per stack. Lose all stacks. Hmm. I mean... Actually, building up shock would not be a bad thing, and this is the highest quality of all of them. However, if I go for this, I do not have enough points to to fully heal, and I think I, I kind of need to fully heal. Uh, we're going to get Inflicting Bleed. There we go, and then we're going to get a nice a big chonky heal there. Uh, over, well, fully heal, I, I, mean, I meant to say uh, gain 10 hit points. Some of them will give a lot more, um, usually at the end of a boss battle. So here we are. This is, if we can get through this, we should get a big wallop of healing. Unfortunately, we need the wallop of healing now to get through this. Uh, and if we manage to get through here, I believe we go back to the Ink Sea for a bit. All right. We're fighting Lusk the Blight Bag. So, you'll notice the little diamond there. This is the boss's HP. It's a lot of HP. Um, they will phase, um, so enter a new phase at this point. And once you've brought them to this damage, they become immune for the rest of that turn. And then lose all dots and any negative effect to start the next phase. So, plan around that because it can be kind of uh, off-putting to suddenly lose all of the dots if you weren't anticipating it. Now, how much damage are you guys going to do? Can I finish you off quickly? These ones are currently... Uh, they will explode by the looks of it on their turn. So that'll be uh, undodgeable damage. The expanding ring like this means that it's going to hit everywhere. Every enemy will be struck. There we go. That takes them out nice and easily. Right, let's go ahead and pop down some poison. There we go. Nice, nice. Uh, that... Gives a nice bit of uh, health loss at the end of the turn by itself. And then we're just going to use up the, the last shuriken there. That drops a little bit more poison, a little bit more bleed. So we are largely going to get through this by afflicting dots. Uh, we'll do the same there. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to teleport out of your area of effect. And that is a big part of the Moss Cloak. The Moss Cloak kind of thrives, lives and survives based on being able to uh, reposition throughout the entire combat. Right, let's drop a little bit more damage down there. I would like to be the other side of you. You're going to turn and attack me wherever I go, so just applying as much damage as I can, really, here. Uh, let's do that again. There we go, and I'm going to grab you. That gives me a uh, cooldown reduction. Now, by dodging through enemies, I gain shield. This shows zero, and this is one of the only things I dislike about the having the uh, extra combat detail always active, is this kind of little blue highlight around my health bar it tells me I've got shield, but this number should tell me how much shield I have. This number should tell me how much health I have. But the kind of advanced combat details is telling me what the state of affairs will be at the end of the of the combat so if i hold down alt which is kind of the reverse behavior of the alt key you usually this is what the state of play is right now i've got one shield and 20 health at the end of the enemy's turn or rather the start of the next round i will have 18 health and zero shield i will always have zero shield at the start of the next round so it doesn't uh, enable you to see very easily how much shield you have but up in the top left here if you've got a lot of shield especially you'll start seeing the blue bar kind of overlaying the red bar and that's how you'll know how much shield you've got generally speaking so let's just pop a little bit more damage here, and then we just kind of have to sit this one out okay a little bit of damage nothing terrible you took a lot of damage though which i'm very on board with uh we are now going to drop poison vapor there we go you will phase this turn so i'm not going to worry over much about how much damage i do i'm just going to focus on shurikens there we go we'll just do a little bit more because it won't matter at this point i will take this now 
is that even though that's not really going to help me, but the reason why I took that is that it reduced the cooldown on Poison Vapor a little bit faster. So you're going to do uh, an attack everywhere. I can't dodge it. The only thing I could do is shield from it. Um, is it worth it? Four damage? Sure, I'll use the potion for that. There we go. And you immediately phase, so I can't do anything to you. But the beautiful thing about phasing them on their turn is that the phase effect ends on my turn. So if you can phase them with a dot, effectively you don't have to play around with them invulnerable to any damage. However, if you can phase them on your turn, it will prevent them from doing anything on their turn as well. So you can avoid an attack that way. This is brutal. I'm not going to lie. This is actually incredibly hopelessly brutal. <sighs> How am I going to do this? Is there a way to do this even? I can hit two enemies at once is the most that I'm going to be able to do, I think. Unless I'm... F yeah, I don't think there's any position where I'm going to be able to hit three at a time. Each one of them is doing four. This is going to hurt a lot. That's you two down. Uh, let's grab this. Can I hit... No, I can't even... Oh, I can actually hit more than one here. Okay, I'm alive at the end of this turn now, which is a big improvement. I may even be alive with slightly more hit points than I was expecting. I can't get the magic pixel there, unfortunately. You know what? This is good enough. Um, there's no way that is going to be safe for me right now. So, positioning just so that I'm in a better position to take out enemies would be useful. They're going to die. They're just going to explode. But uh, Oh, actually, I thought there was a, a spawn point down here. Never mind. It, it really didn't matter where I was on the, on the field then of battle. Okay, they've grouped up a little bit, so that's good for me. Also, this is a area of effect in this location, which I can use to my advantage. Go take me two out. I'm going to grab this. I need to end with two points and teleport over there to take out this little lusk. I'm going to grab you and drop a big wallop load of poison on you. We're going to portal over. Can I hit? No, there's absolutely no way of me doing that. We're going to portal over then. I'm just going to take you out with two hits of my shuriken. That stops me from taking any damage. And on the next turn, we've got this in crit phase. I've got a lot to go. I've got a long way to go before I survive this battle. But, you know, we're doing the best we can. However, it's getting increasingly difficult to survive. Uh, can I... Oh, I can hit three here. That's going to be well worth it. Can I hit three back? Is there any version of positioning that would allow me to do that? No. Hmm. There is... Well, for now then, I'm just going to do this, as that's going to stack a lot of poison. I'm going to grab that orb. That gives me enough for me to wander over here. Can I hit both of you? I can. All right, well, I can, at the very least, take both of you out. In fact, I'm going to portal down here. And do a little bit more damage as well. You are almost ready to die. On, you will die on this turn, and I will survive with 3 HP. <laughs> ah, like I said, it's not over until it's over, especially with a dot build. There we go. All right, not terribly bad. Uh, we're over halfway now to the main quest, and only one-third through the dive. And we've already got the carved talent of sin effect in play so now poison is only going down by 33 not 50 percent per turn okay we can upgrade we can ascend one of our bindings so we can turn flurry into poison outburst or lethal burst lethal burst will increase the amount of damage it does uh, it'll consume shurikens and then unleash them forward with each one dealing 48 damage so it's basically just a flat upgrade on the shurikens but if you defeat an enemy you will gain three shurikens and reset the cooldown to zero so it makes it more dangerous and it makes it possible to just recast it straight away. That's a big one. Poison Outburst. This is the only skill so far that has no poison um, effect right now. Uh, but this would give us Poison Outburst, which would deal 10 damage. So we would reduce the damage I deal per shuriken by 20 each, which is quite a lot. But each one would inflict 10 stacks of poison. 
as you can imagine, that will build hopelessly fast. And considering poison also inflicts days, but I do inflict poison with kind of everything I do. Mm, I can't say no. I think we're going to go with poison outburst. Let's grab that one. There we go. And now, at this point, we can have a look around. Putrid uh, Poison. We could increase the poison damage that we do with that. Uh, gain critical charge on a random binding uh, when I use this ability. That would actually be quite nice to increase my crit potential. Or discount Flurry. Currently, Flurry costs one will. My lord, this on top of the pr previous one would have been... Uh, the, the lethal Flurry would have been broken. It would have cost me nothing, and as long as I killed something, I could cast it again. Actually broken. Uh, nevertheless, I think that is possibly the best one to go for, just reducing the cost there is going to be pretty, pretty solid for us. But I'm afraid, as we return to the Sea of Ink, ready to select the second book of this deep dive, we've run all out of time for this video. However, if you've made it this far and would like to see the run continue, I suppose there's enough ink on our quill to write the rest of the story in an extended first day. So let me know down below if you'd like to see this run's conclusion, and we might see a part two follow in the next few days. Regardless, though, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you do decide to pick up Inkbound for yourself, consider popping into the Dapper Del Discord server and checking if there's anyone up to join you in a dive. I know of at least a few, myself included, who are always up for a run. But with that said, it is time to wrap things up, so until next time, and as always, do take care, everyone. <laughs>